So, thank you very much for coming and uh, having the opportunity to talk about the dark side of the universe. Uh, I'm not going to try and cover the science in this, in this exhibition, but uh, some issues that are related to it. Uh, and when I'm preparing this talk, I realized that some of the images that we get in the sky are really beautiful like that, that's art. So this is art from the cosmos, from nature. Um, so, is this is this like a lot, is it? I'm sorry, I should put it on. All right, thank you, so I'll start again. So a lot of what the talk is about is about the universe and things that were discovered really by astronomers. I'm a particle physicist. I was an astronomy kid um, as a kid, but I went into particle physics thinking, well, I could still be an amateur astronomer if I did particle physics professionally. They've come together and now we find that astronomy, cosmology, the universe, and particle physics are closely related. So anyway, a bit of history, I was a professor at Stockholm University before I came to the States 31 years ago, and uh, I was privileged to be part of discovering top four, which is the heaviest particle we know, subatomic particle. It's about as heavy as a gold nucleus, a particle a thousand times smaller than a proton, smaller still. And then I'm doing experiments at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, which is a multinational laboratory. This is all over the world work there. And uh, that is a 16-mile ring of superconducting magnets on the ground colliding protons in both directions. And we discovered the Higgs boson there 10 years ago, which was the last sort of keystone of the standard model of particles. Um, but um, astronomers, then, these are pictures, obviously it's a picture, uh, a photograph of part of the sky on the telescope, and on the left is a computer simulation of how matter in the universe can be not uniform, but, um, but distributed. But astronomers found, they credit, that actually um, the matter we know about in atoms uh, is only a small part of everything there is. It's only like four or five percent, something like that. And I have this t-shirt which says, don't trust an atom, they make up everything. But it's not true actually, because they only make up about four or five percent of everything in the universe. And we found that about 21% 20, of the universe is called dark matter. We think it's made of particles we haven't yet discovered, but we don't know that for sure. We're looking for them. It could be particles that they interact only with gravity, because they were discovered by astronomers because of their gravity. They act on stars and galaxies. But then most of the universe seems to be mysterious stuff with dark energy, which is simply a property of space that's making the universe expand faster and faster and faster. And if that goes on forever and ever, then the universe will get more and more dilute. And I'll talk a bit about some of these things. But apart from apart from the um, so here, here, when I was a kid, I could go outside my house in the south of England, and on a dark night, I could see the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy with my naked eye. Um, and then, uh, but between the stars, the sky is dark, and I'll say a bit why that is. But this is a photograph, obviously, more recently, towards the center of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. And in the Milky Way, there's something like 100,000 million stars. And 100 years ago, we thought, most people thought, the Milky Way galaxy is the whole of the universe. We're in this galaxy with all these stars, and that is the universe. We didn't know for sure that there were other galaxies out there. Um, and uh, it was uh, when Hubble uh, 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 measured the distance to the Andromeda galaxy and other nebulae in the sky, some of which are just clouds of gas, but others are distant galaxies, realizing that actually there's something like 100,000 million galaxies in the visible universe. I could say 100 billion, I'd like to say 100,000 million, because it sounds, it sounds better, but it's an incredible number, of course. That's not precise, I mean, some twice as big, some are half as big, and so on and so forth. But when you look at this, you see the stars, in between the stars, it's dark. And you can zoom in with a great telescope, and you've perhaps seen images from the James Webb Space Telescope recently, that have come out. But this is actually a, a new image from the James Webb Space Telescope. Remarkable achievement. They sent this rocket up um, to about a million kilometers away from Earth, and 
the mirrors of the telescope unfolded and all formed together a giant mirror. Now, that picture, they chose to look in a part of the sky where there are no stars in our galaxy, okay? So we're looking out beyond, out beside the Milky Way, a patch of sky, about a grain of sand at arm's length. Imagine looking at a grain of sand at arm's length in the direction where there are no stars and taking a long exposure photograph with this James Webb Space Telescope. And everything you see in there, they're not stars, every one of them is a galaxy. You see uh, some of them look black shaped, some of them are stretched out into, into streaks and so on, and uh, you see various streaks there. Those galaxies are not that shaped, they've been spread into that shape by the gravitational field of a cluster of galaxies that actually close to us. But when you realize that everything in that, in that image is a galaxy, and it's the size of a grain of sand at arm's length, so how many of those can you fit over the whole sky? And you figure out that there's something like 100,000 million galaxies in our visible universe. And 100 years ago, we didn't even know there was more than one. So what progress we've made there. And, it, and these galaxies, the light you're seeing here is 11, 12 billion years ago. It's been coming to us for all that time. Um, it's actually in infrared, but they've converted, they've shifted it a bit into the visible wavelength. Uh, to, see, to see the images. Um, and here's another one. But the question actually, Heinrich Olbers back in the 18th century thought, why is the sky dark at night? He didn't quite understand it because, you know, if you look at the sun, we see the sun half a degree across, it's a bright object. If it was twice as far away as it is, it'd look a quarter of the size, but there'd be a quarter of the light. And the, surface brightness would be identical. So it doesn't matter how far away a sun, which is just the closest star, is, the surface brightness is the same. So Albert said, if the universe is infinite, it goes on forever in all directions, and it's populated uniformly with stars, and, and it's static, it's not expanding or contracting, then the whole sky would be as bright as the surface of the sun. And it isn't, obviously, it's, it's dark between the stars. And of course, that was called a paradox, but it's not really a paradox, it's an observation. And the answer is, it's dark in between the galaxies because the universe is not in there, and it's not been there forever. It started about 13.7 billion years ago. So one's looking back in time to the early universe. And if the universe had been living forever, an infinite past, and not expanding past, it would be as bright as the surface of the sun everywhere. Now, actually, in, between, in the dark we see, in between these distant galaxies, there's, there's no light, visible light there, but there is microwaves, actually. And that was discovered by Panzias and Wilson, who were working with, um, actually, with, um, doing experiments in satellite communications. This was way back in the, in the early 60s, and people would thinking of using balloons up in space to bounce radio signals off. So they built this giant like, ear trumpet. It's a big thing to pick up microwaves from the sky and use it in experiments in satellite communications. But they found that there was a, a noise, a sort of background hiss from all over the sky. And um, that is actually a long wavelength microwaves, so the longer wavelengths than infrared, coming from the whole sky. We got the Nobel Prize for this discovery, but actually it had been predicted um, before this by uh, some physicists who noted that as the universe is expanding, the galaxies are moving further away from us, and that was discovered by Hubble, the whole universe expanding. And if you imagine that and, and reverse the clock, so that you're looking backwards in time, the galaxies would all be closer together, you go further back, they're closer and closer together. And they said that the origin of the universe would be a small, very hot thing called the Big Bang. Actually, the Big Bang term was given not by them, but by another astronomer called Fred Hoyle, who was a great science fiction writer, actually. And he didn't believe in the Big Bang. He thought the universe went upwards, had an infinite past, so it could steady state. 
Um, so he used big bangers on your ice cream truck. It turned out that's how it is, and that nearly everybody believes that the universe started with this big bang about 13.7 billion years ago, which wasn't big, it was actually tiny, 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 much smaller than an atom. Um, and, and so they discovered that the whole sky, everything between the galaxies, was not totally dark. It's dark by light, but it had these microwaves, which are sort of short wavelength radio waves. And this is now measured over the whole sky. This is a, a map of the whole sky, drawn like you might see a map of the, of the globe of the Earth, in these microwaves. And it's, it's got the same spectrum as a hot body, sorry, a body that's only, not hot really, it's very cold, it's 2.7 Kelvin above absolute zero. But that is a particular spectrum of, of, wave, of wavelengths of microwaves. And the whole sky is of about that temperature, uh, except for these tiny fluctuations. You see the, the reddish blobs and the bluish blobs, they're only um, very small fluctuations, 18 millionths of a, of, of a, of a, degree, of a, ke of a Kelvin, or 18 micro Kelvins. Slightly warmer, slightly colder patches. And we think those originated from quantum fluctuations at the Big Bang itself. Um, and that form started forming structure in the universe because where you have a region that's denser by chance than other regions, they tend to collapse by its own gravity to form deeper, uh, more and more dense regions, which eventually became galaxies and stars. That's one of the early things, when you see the sort of uh, over the sky, you see this region that looks a bit like Africa there, the blue region. That's a blue region going to be slightly slightly colder than the rest, and slightly denser. This is a more a later picture from Planck satellite, which is showing the same thing in more detail. The same sort of pictures are there. But the patches are slightly warmer, slightly colder, slightly denser, slightly less dense, only by 0.01%, but they, they eventually condense together. The denser patches would fall under their own gravity to make galaxies or stars and the blue patches would eventually end up in voids or empty regions of, of, of the universe. And I'll show you pictures of the voids. I have one graph to show you on the next slide here. So if, if people ask, what, what, is the, what are the patterns here? How big are those patches? Some of you see big patches, some are small patches, but they could measure the, the, the dimensions of the patches by doing what's called a Fourier analysis of the sky map. And when they do that, they come up with the data points here on this graph. And um, on the left, um, two, two is, a, is dividing the whole sky into two, two halves. In ten, you're dividing into ten pieces, and so on. And this, the dots on here represent observations derived from the patches in the microwave background. And the curve through it is actually a theoretical curve um, of a theory of how the Big Bang happened uh, from a patch that's much smaller than an atom and then it, it inflated and grew, grew exponentially until it, the whole universe was about the size of an orange or, or a football or something like that and then something stopped expanding so fast and it heated up and that was when the whole universe was this size but extremely hot and dense and, uh, and then it's been expanding ever since. So. Um, this is a sort of cartoon of the whole history of the universe. Uh, the escape space state is very compressed. On the right and the left here you see those quantum fluctuations uh, because of this constant that you know, Planck and Einstein understood that, um, that at the subatomic level there are fluctuations in the density of space and so on. And then this inflation happened. That was the doubling and doubling and doubling of the universe every trillion per second until it was this size. And then it stopped expanding so fast and started expanding more slowly and you see that. Now we're way on the right here, 13.7 billion years later, and these fluctuations in density become stars and galaxies and planets and so on. So it's a sort of cartoon here. Another sort of artistic view of this is on this slide, on the left, you see the 
fluctuations in microwave background that I showed before, and then this is picked out a couple of patches there, and time goes to the right, and, and those variations in the density of the microwave background develop into, into galaxies in, in, in the present time. So it, it's the sort of cartoon of the right light. But when astronomers look out at the sky and measure thousands of galaxies and plot where they are in the sky, they get pictures like this. So I call it an interconnected web of galaxies. Every point in this picture is a galaxy, and you see way down at the bottom of the apex, and the distance out is actually called redshift. It's how far away they are from us. They're moving apart from us. And then this is a wedge of the sky. And you see that it's not smooth and uniform. The galaxies cluster in clumps and walls and clusters and so on. And in between there are regions where there are very few galaxies. So the galaxies form sheets and voids and strings and clusters. And theoretical physicists can calculate how these things might happen. And they wrote past computer programs with thousands of lines of code to simulate what would happen if you started with fairly uniform, uh, fairly uniform microwave background, but let it develop forward in time, and then you get you get an images like this. Um, so you see, this is a computer simulation, but there's not a picture down on the bottom right. But this one has got, and that is just it's it's beautiful art if you like, but it's that is actually nature, but this is, this is not observations. Uh, this particular picture is a simulation by computer code of how, how that could happen. And here's another picture actually from a movie that you can find on the web because we calculate in time how these sheets and clusters form and the distribution on the left is the density of matter on a region that's 350 million light years on the side, it's just a small part of the universe. And they calculate the temperature of the gas as well, that's on the right side, you can see there's a correlation between them. So it's a big computer program, the Illustrious Project it's called, and they, they simulate the history of the growth density, showing that our galaxies and stars condensed out of matter were actually seeded by fluctuations at the quantum level in the, in the Big Bang itself. Here's another picture which is beautiful art, right? But that's a simulation of the computer. And the colors represent temperature somehow. And here's another one. This is now, this is now the cube that I mentioned, 350 million light years on each side, the matter density, and you're seeing the incredible detailed structures there. And um, now we can actually measure the density of matter in the universe using gravitational bending. So gravity, as like Einstein pointed out, bends light rays. They get bent by gravity. They go as straight as they can, but it's not really straight, if you like. And, and mass bends space and time. And that is shown as a cartoon here, looking as if the mass of the Earth is bending space. But the space is shown as a two-dimensional sheet. Really, it's three dimensions, so it's harder to visualize. And really, it's space-time. Space and time is a four-dimensional thing in the event. But this really gives you an idea that actually, as Einstein said, gravity is actually bent in space-time. And uh, so when he, uh, when he actually, way back, Isaac Newton had a question in his optics book, query one. Do not bodies act upon light at a distance and by their action bend its rays? And it's not this action Materialist Pyrrhus and that is strongest at least isn't. That was a question he had. And then Einstein said that that was right. Actually, Einstein's theory gave twice the deflection of Newton's so did. But he said that if you looked at stars behind the sun, then the apparent direction or this position of them would be distorted by the gravity of the sun. That was in a paper in 1911. But he calculated the angle of deflection, which is very small, it's like a penny at three miles away, with something that's grazing, grazing the sun. Now, of course, you can't see stars behind the sun in daylight because the atmosphere is blue and bright. But when you have an eclipse of the sun, total eclipse, the moon passes in front, blocks the sunlight, the sky becomes dark, and for a few minutes, you can photograph stars that are way behind the sun 
And uh, Eddington did this in 1919 and showed that indeed uh, starlight was bent by the gravity of the sun. And that made instantly Einstein famous, um, Newton was overthrown, a new theory of space and time. Bottom right, you see a graph showing the deflection of the stars, comparing photographs of the stars behind the sun when the sun was there but eclipsed when it wasn't there. So you can mention that, and it worked very well. Um, so now we use the bending of light by gravity to actually measure um, the mass in the universe. So here, here there's, there's two bright objects there. They're actually called quasars. They're extremely bright objects. But actually, it's a single quasar that's seen in two images because in between them, which are very far away, um, there's a galaxy, a massive galaxy cluster about four billion light years away, and that bends the light to left and right. And we see the quasar as two images. One bent to the left of the galaxy, the other bent to the right of the galaxy. And because the path lengths are a bit different, and the signal's varying, it goes up and down. There's actually a 14 months delay between the signals, which is what it's calculated. So this is, that was in 1971. It's the first time we had a double image, predicted by Einstein in 36. He said, of course, there's no hope of observing this phenomenon directly, but he didn't know about the Hubble Space Telescope and so on. So, but, you know, we actually, and now there's a more spectacular one here, where, it's actually a supernova that's brighter than the whole galaxy. It's a star that blows up um, and for a short period of days, it's brighter than the whole galaxy. And this one, you see it four times, four, four images of it, because in front, there's a galaxy that bends the light from the quasar, and it has four ways of getting to us during the next five minutes. So and there's time lags, so one image brightened up and the other one brightened up later because the path of length is a bit longer. It's come around with galaxy the other way. Now, this picture, there's no stars in this picture. Everyone is a galaxy, okay? Um, and apart from one supernova that you see four times there. And this is a cartoon here, how that's the Hubble Space Telescope. And then um, on the far right, you see that red object, which is a supernova star blowing up a thing as bright as 100,000 million stars temporarily and then the galaxy in front of it that bends the light around to the left and right and above and below making those four images. So it's another proof that space-time is not really flat, mass bends it and, um, and, it, uh, and because we can measure the mass of, of, ga of galaxies and bending it from the distortion and here's a very special one called the Einstein ring, where you see it. Actually, there's a, the red blob in the middle is a galaxy. It's right in front of a more distant galaxy that's blue, way behind it. And because it happens to be almost exactly in line, the light from the blue galaxy is bent all the way around. There's no longer four separate images, but a spread out, and uh, it makes it makes a beautiful sort of thing. So that is another confirmation of, of, of the mass. Well, from these observations, we can calculate the mass in that foreground galaxy and find that it's actually more mass there than we could infer from the number of stars and gas and dust in that galaxy. So uh, we can measure the, the mass of that galaxy in front from the way it bends the light of the galaxy behind. And another beautiful image, this is galaxy cluster, each, peak, each spike here is a galaxy, and this vertical is a density of the mass, the mass divided by the area, as inferred by this bending of light by the foreground galaxies. So it's showing through the distribution of mass in the galaxy cluster, and you see there's a large, a large bump, hump, which is the mass that's, uh, that's more than the stars and gas and dust. And that is a, a sort of image of where the dark matter is. So the matter is there because it has gravity. Astronomers showed it's there because of the distribution. But um, we think it's made of particles we haven't yet discovered. Um, here's now uh, a 
diagram showing clusters of galaxies in our neighborhood. We're, we're in the Milky Way galaxy, supposed to be in the middle of that diagram, but there are clusters of galaxies in the ground. You see, but, so it's, 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 it's not uniform. The intersections of the sheets are uh, given rise to clusters of galaxies. And this was the first clue about dark matter. And that was coming from this astronomer Fritz Zwicky, Swiss, America. He called it Dunkel Materie, which means translated dark matter, but it's really invisible matter. So he looked at a cluster of galaxies in the coma, uh, the coma um, constellation, a thousand galaxies. And he said, how come this cluster of galaxies has held together? He could count, see how fast they were moving because of the so-called Doppler shift, when galaxies are moving towards you, they look a bit bluer when they're away from you, they're a bit redder. You will calculate the energy the galaxies have, or the speeds they have, and say, this cluster should have been blown apart billions of years ago, but it's still held together. There must be more mass there than we can see in the stars and gases. He actually estimated a lot more mass, in fact, the 500, which is way too much, actually, but he was the first person to suggest that there's more matter that we can know about in stars and gas. Um, but then things really became much more convincing later, after the in the, in, in the 70s, um, largely by this astronomer Vera Rubin. You see her there at the telescope, and she used an instrument developed by a colleague called Henry Ford that was very good at measuring the speed of stars. And the picture on the bottom right you see is a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, on a clear dark night, if you're away from cities, you can see it with your naked eye, you see the bright part in the middle. But what she could do was look at stars on one end and the other, and measure the spectrum of light from stars. And when the stars are coming towards you, the spec their light is a bit bluish, when they're going away it's a bit reddish, it's a bit red shift. And it's the same thing if you're standing beside a highway, a car comes by and goes, yeah, that's the sound that pitches high when it comes towards you, low when it goes away from you. So the car comes, yeah. and if you measure that, you can tell how fast the car is going, that's how please catch you with the radar. But um, they, she did it with these stars, and she found that the stars on one side were coming towards us, the other side going away from us. So she could calculate the rotation of this galaxy. That's like the Milky Way, but it's, of course we can't see that around science, it's the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a similar galaxy to ours. But for calculating the rotation curves, she found that it didn't work if there were only stars and gas and dust. And you see this graph on the bottom right here. This is the velocity of stars, kilometers per second, as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy in light years, galaxies of 10, 20,000 light years. Away. And what she expected was that the, the velocity would increase as you get more and more matter inside your orbit, but then it would go away again. But it didn't, it kept, it kept going up. So, faster and faster, and she would calculate from such graphs the amount of matter inside a particular radius. And it turned out to be uh, quite a bit more than, um, than in stars, gas, dust, and planets. Here's another picture there. She loved, loving astronomy, and um, she really should have gotten a Nobel Prize for this, but she did not. Uh, neither did Hubble, by the way. Um, astronomy wasn't considered physics in those days, but clearly she should have. It's clearly a, uh, unfortunate. Um, she died only Christmas Day about three years ago. But at least she gets a telescope named in her honor. That's the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile. A large telescope named after her. Uh, I would comment that three men got the Nobel Prize for dark energy discovery on less solid ground than, than her dark matter discovery. So it really is an injustice. Um, so now here's another image from James Webb Space Telescope on the right. Again, a tiny piece of the sky, image with this amazing telescope. And the image on the right now is, is the uh, light, or actually infrared, is turned into, into, into colors there. But on the top left, you see same image, but the contours you see in green there are showing the density of the matter, the mass, that is calculated from 
was lensing light from galaxies way, way behind. So the galaxy, the cluster of galaxies shifts and distorts images of the background galaxies are much further away. And so when you map out the distribution of matter in these distant clusters of find it's more matter than, than, than we can account for. So what is it made of? Well here's by the way another nice picture. This is actually from Hubble I think. But the blue the blue distorted things you see are the background galaxies and their image has been it's the same one that's shown several times because of the way it comes far behind. Now here's a James Webb Space Telescope. You've probably seen that in the news. They went up uh, just at the end of last year, and all those segments of mirror, I think it's uh, 16 or 18 mirror segments, hexagons, and they were all folded up like origami on the rocket. They went out, and they had to open up and be matched together. So precisely, it was like one huge mirror. And it's way off behind, on the opposite side of the sun, of the Earth and the sun. And at the bottom you see this uh, sunshade that uh, blocks the heat and light from the sun and allows this telescope to be kept at very, very cold temperatures so that it can actually see, see these uh, infrared objects in the sky. And it's producing beautiful images. You see here another amazing one with Stefan's quintet. It's five galaxies. Two of them are sort of interacting with each other there. But um, I mean, it's, so, it's just so beautiful. And there'll be many more images coming from this, which has become so much better than the Hubble, which was already so much better than anything before. And here's another amazing image. This is also from the James Webb. And the orange you see is clouds of gas that have not yet condensed into stars in front of a background of the stars that have formed themselves. So, um, now here's more evidence for dark matter. And this was quite a convincing thing. It's actually called the bullet cluster of galaxies, but it's really two galaxies clusters that are passing pass through each other. They pass through each other and you know if the galaxy, if the Andromeda galaxy passed through our Milky Way, it would disturb us a bit, but the space between the stars is big enough that it wouldn't perhaps completely destroy our solar system. But here in this picture superimposed three pictures. One is the visible light showing the galaxies, the, the whitish blobs on on the dark background. The, and then they took a image of x-rays, which shows what the hot gas is. And that's the red blobs there. And then the blue blobs are the calculated mass distribution using bending the gravity of the, of the galaxies in further away. So what you see is that the matter and the, and the hot gas, the mass and the hot gas are not in the same place. What's happened is the galaxy cluster pass through each other and the, the Hot gas has been slowed down by the collision, but the, the stars have gone, gone through. So it's, it's, work, it's some evidence for dark matter here. What is it? It's not atoms. It's made of something else. Um, now I'm coming on to the story of black holes here, because it seems that the centers of galaxies all have black holes in, that sometimes are millions of times more massive than the sun. And the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, 2020 was given these three. Penrose was a theorist, but, but uh, Andrea Guess and Richard, they were able to image stars very close to the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, the picture on the right, you see, it's a bit blurry. There's, you see stars, they're all stars there, looking towards the center of the galaxy. And the zoom in on the top right corner shows SGRA, Sagittarius. And Sagittarius is, a, is, a, is the constellation. It's a, and the cross is where the central is. This too is a star nearby that they could see moving. Now, how they could make a much better image. The thing is that that image is blurred a bit because of the atmospheric turbulence. High in the atmosphere is wobbling around, and, and that's what makes stars twinkle. When you see the stars twinkling, the light is being bent by turbulence in the atmosphere. They could very cleverly count, uh, remove that by sending a laser beam up into the sky, and that laser beam from the telescope excited sodium atoms high in the atmosphere. And you could see the little, uh, like, like an artificial star that was jumping around um, on a sort of second time scale, and they could use that to take out the effect of the turbulence in the sky. And with that, 
they were able to find stars very close to Sagittarius A and convince, convince us that Sagittarius A had a mass of about four million suns mass. Um, and then these stars are going around in orbits, uh, taking a year or two or so. We can measure the radial velocity of the star from this redshift, and so on. And we could show the mass in the middle there. And it had to be a black hole. But more recently, we've actually made images of that black hole. That was, that was a great breakthrough. And now you may have seen pictures of a donut thing looking like a black hole. And that's come from this so-called Event Horizon Telescope. Now, this is actually a global network you see of many telescopes, radio telescopes, or microwaves, right in the South Pole in Antarctica, in Birmingham, where I work, as part of that project. And these other ones, all of these different radio telescopes record, look at, look at the center of the galaxy, the Milky Way or another galaxy, and record the microwaves from that. But they're able to combine them, keeping the phase information accurate, so it's as if you have the resolution of a telescope as big as the Earth, right? Um, combining the signals, so the resolution is fantastically good. Um, and with that, they're able to see the first one was the first image of a black hole that's actually in the center of a galaxy far away, M87. And this black hole in there is six and a half billion times the mass of the Sun. And it's, it's huge. It's like size of our, of our Milky Way, but what you see in this image that they reconstructed from combining all these all these telescopes, it looks like a sort of donut with a bright part, That's, and the black bit in the middle is not the black hole itself, the black hole is even smaller than that, but this is the light that's been bent around the side of the black hole, and the form of this image is just exactly what was calculated by Einstein's theory. That's a picture of Katie Boomer, who was one of the team who developed the algorithm for this. And that was a great breakthrough to see the imaging of a black hole, the environment, the surroundings of the black hole. And now this year, we have another one. This is an image of the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. It's not nearly as massive, it's four billion times the mass of the sun. But there's gas and dust falling in, hot, and what you're seeing is the hot, the hot gas around that and being bent by the gravity. Stars orbiting that, I showed you the pictures of stars that are going around it, they'll fall in eventually. Uh, and, but this, the size of this ring is like seeing a donut on the surface of the moon. The resolution is so incredible. So now we have a lot of information about black holes. Um, what are they made of? Well, this is one slide about particle physics, okay? It's what the standard model of particles, of course, is. And, on the top right, you see in pink, six known particles called quarks, and the U and D are in that circle there because the up quark and the down quark combine together to make protons and neutrons in the center of our atoms. So atoms are made of bottoms, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and these the neutrinos, the, the new sign. Proton is made of an up and an up and a down quark, neutron up and down and down, and there's the electron going around the atoms. So that's all normal matter. The other particles, C, the child, S, the strange, T and B, top and bottom, they were discovered at Birmingham where I work. And so was the third type of neutrino, the tower neutrino, found at Birmingham as well. So those 12 particles on the left, the particles are matter, and, and then they seem to make up all of matter, indeed, the left in, in yellow is the stable matter that make up atoms. On the right you see four boxes, Z, W, Gamma, and G. Those are the particles that carry forces between, between these particles, stick them together into nuclei. And in the middle they put the Higgs boson. That was something that was theoretically predicted in 64 when I started my research actually. And then it was discovered 10 years ago at CERN. And it gives mass to all these particles, except for the gamma and the proton. But this is, as I say, dark matter and dark energy are not part of this diagram. We don't know where they fit. There's a fit in this diagram on the other side. 95% of the stuff in the universe is dark matter and dark energy. But gravity, other dimensions of space, is 
many mysteries there. So could dark matter, what is it? We think it's made of particles that we haven't yet discovered. Uh, some people call particles machos, massive compact halo objects. These would be like black holes or neutron stars or white dwarfs. Stars that are actually made of matter, but we haven't yet found them. The small black holes out in, in between the stars that we haven't found. They're called matches, but they could also be weakly interacting massive particles they're called wimps. Um, and uh, experts think that those matches, massive objects, are probably a small contribution. Probably these are particles, weakly interacting massive particles, we haven't yet discovered. I didn't mention neutrinos, they fill the universe up, but they're extremely light. The trillions going through one little finger every second coming from the sun, but they're too light to make dark matter. So we're looking for dark matter. Many experiments. Here's a new one um, that is called Le Lux Zeppelin. They put it deep underground, a mile underground in a mine, to, to stop most of the cosmic ray particles coming from the sky. And it's a big tank of liquid xenon, which is a very cold, clear, dense liquid, eight tons of it. Xenon you might find in flashlights and in the nights, xenon lamps. They managed to get eight tons of this and put it in a big tank. And if a dark matter particle from the space comes and hits one of the nuclei, it could scatter it and make a flash of light that they can detect in the detector. And they've been running this and they've had to remove all the contamination, radioactive rocks and so on. Very, very difficult, but they haven't found any evidence yet that dark matter particles coming from the sky. Um, now, most of this, as I said, think that it's made of the weakly attracted massive particles. I'm working at the Large Hadron Collider, and maybe they're being produced there. Um, but they could be particles that only interact with matter and gravity. Um, but they could also be particles that come weakly to known matter particles and to dark matter particles. These are called portals, like a doorway to the dark side. And theorists have thought of many types. One's called a dark photon like the photon and particle of light, gamma ray, but it has some, uh, some mass and it couples to charge very much less. The dark Higgs, we've discovered the Higgs boson, I mentioned that 10 years ago, its mass is 125 GeV units, but maybe there's another one with a mass of 10 or 12 or 15 units and not yet seen. Um, and there's also sort of heavy neutral leptons that are like neutrinos, but they're heavier than so all these are possible theory things, and I'm working on a project at CERN to hopefully discover some of the particles if they really exist. And there's a pink blob there in the graph of the mass of the particle against the interaction strength of the facet could look in a region where nobody else has seen. So that's exciting for me to see if we can find these things. And here is the experiment we want to do it with. Um, this is an experiment I work on at CERN, it's called CMS, the Compact Neuron Solenoid. And a few thousand of us are working on that huge project. You see the person there down on the left, you see this huge, and it's um, full of electronics. It's like a huge digital camera. And there's a billion proton collisions going on every second in this, and we select the ones that we think are most interesting that could be signs of dark matter or portals and so on. So, this is uh, one of the two really big experiments at CERN in Geneva, the Large Hadron Collider. And when I was there recently, a month ago, I saw a poster on the wall, a corridor, and I thought that was called uh, Dark Matter Particles. Are they wimps? That's weakly interacting massive particles. Sips are strongly interacting, bent feebly, primal black holes, and so on. All these different possibilities, including axion down the bottom. And people are looking for axion like particles that could convert to photons, and even um, if they have right properties, you could turn them into gamma rays and suck energy out of them. That would be really something amazing, if it's possible. Um, and then dark energy, I haven't said much about it, because I don't know much about it. It just seems to be making the universe expand faster and faster, accelerating the expansion. And this is a cartoon how that's happening. But if it carries on like that, it's going to blow the universe to bits. So we will have less and less energy. So we come down to an electron every cubic light here or something like that. 
Now Einstein started this game because Einstein, when he did a, applied his equations to the universe, he thought it, his equation said it should be expanding or contracting, but not static. And he thought it was static. He didn't know about Hubble's discovery yet until uh, about 100 years ago. So to make it static, he invented, he invented a term called the cosmological constant, put it in to make it static. And when he found from Hubble that the universe is actually expanding, um, he said, oh, that was a big mistake he made. He could have predicted that. But now we find it expanding faster and faster. And at Fermilab, where I work, we have a dark energy survey measuring the redshift and the speed of millions of galaxies to find if the dark energy is constant time, or is it getting bigger or less? Is it uniform in space? Is it forever and forever? Or is it going to disappear and the universe come back down to a big crunch? And if so, is it made of weird particles? And I had this crazy idea that made it made of tachyon sort of particles always travel fast and speed right? I have one more, two more slides to show, but I couldn't stop mentioning about symmetries. Because symmetries and broken symmetries seem to be at the basis of physics, basically. And um, symmetry, imagine a perfect sphere. Any rotation leaves it exactly the same. It's a mathematical object. Any direction is the same. It's perfectly symmetrical. And Emmy Nerfer, the mathematical physicist, or the mathematician, really, she proved that if physics doesn't depend on the orientation in space, you're out in space, you're in a laboratory, freely falling, it doesn't matter which orientation you have, physics is the same. And if that's true, angular momentum must be conserved. And you see a picture of the skater on the right, who starts pirouetting with her arms out, and brings them in, speeds up. That's conservation of angular momentum. Um, it helps you ride a bicycle too. And then she went further and said, if physics doesn't depend on the location in space, where you are in the universe, as long as you're outside gravity fields, physics is the same, momentum is conserved, and it doesn't depend on what time you are, yesterday, today, tomorrow, the same physics is there, energy must be conserved. So, and then we have um, broken symmetries, which are in, in this is more complex internal space, but for example, the up and down force, they would have the same mass if this internal symmetry was perfect. They'd have identical masses, but there's not, it's broken. The mass of the D quark is a bit more than the mass of the up quark. That makes neutrons heavy than protons, makes neutrons decay, protons stable, makes life possible, hydrogen possible. So then when a theory came to identify unify electromagnetism and the weak interactions, they found that the perfect symmetry would have made these, um, these forces identical, but they're not, symmetry is broken, and the theory came left photon massless, but the weak bosons massive, and that predicted the Higgs field, which was predicted in 1564, and finally, and Higgs said there should be a particle goes with it, we found it in 2012, it's certainly not happening. So, it's a short summary, I don't know how long I've taken, but we don't know what most mass of the universe is. Dark matter, we found it by astronomy, it's got gravity, it's not like stars, planets, dust, gas, it's something else. Um, evidence comes from galaxy clusters, rotation of galaxies, light bending. Black holes, we know, they're dark, uh, they exist with a range of masses. Some are just a few times the mass of the sun, but can be a billion times the mass of the sun. We think dark matter is probably made of new particles we haven't yet discovered. We're searching in underground experiments, and we're looking at the production of the Large Hadron Collider. Exciting project there. Maybe there are these portal particles connecting dark matter with known particles, um, but through a very weak sort of connection. And we're just driven to understand the universe we live in. And uh, so, thank you. And I hope you this. When they look very closely, there's some parts of the galaxy that there's absolutely nothing there. How do you how do you know it's not just because you don't have the ability to detect what's there? It's, well, it's really not part of the galaxy. Because the galaxy is formed of stars, and we know that when the nearest star, us, is four light years away, right? We're very close to the sun, which is eight, nine minutes away. So most of the space between stars is is 
empty of stars, there is some gas in there that we can measure by light absorbing. But the voids or emptiness I was talking about was where there seemed to be almost no galaxies. So when you look at the distribution of galaxies, and now with uh, like uh, the sky surveys, like this is a digital sky survey that was part of the Fermia, they measure positions of 100,000 galaxies in the sky. And they measure the direction, of course, that's where you see them in the sky, and how far away they are, um, which you measure from the recession velocity. So you make a 3D map of where the galaxies are. And you find they're not uniform through the universe. They seem to be clumped in sheets and voids and so on. So um, at least we're not seeing, we're seeing large volumes of space, intergalactic space, that have almost no galaxies in, and others that have a lot of galaxies in. Now, it's a good question that when we see the regions avoid no galaxies, or very few galaxies, um, but is there dark matter? There should be dark energy there, we think. But um, as far as we know, dark energy is just uniform everywhere. It's not, it, it doesn't, it doesn't clump or anti clump We're not sure about that. Um, but dark matter does map out where mass is in the universe. And it does also show these regions. So we call them voids. They're not totally empty space. But there's no real empty space in a way because you could, you could try and get a little tiny box try and make it empty by taking out all the atoms. You can imagine taking out all the atoms in a little box. It's still got a uh, gravity field in there, electromagnetic field in there. You could take that little tiny box out into space and let it fall freely. Say, I've got rid of the gravity field in there. You've got rid of the electromagnetic fields in there by making it very cold. Is it empty? Well, it's as empty as it possibly can be. But there's still this heat field in there. Um, which and the dark energy in there, and whether they're how they're related, we just don't know that. Yet. Maybe dark energy and the Higgs field are somehow coupled together. I mean, it's all physics is all sort of coupled together in some ways. We haven't found it. But it would be a breakthrough if we could show that dark energy is not totally uniform. Maybe it, it's clumpy, like dark matter is. But that's hard to do. Not yet done. We have to measure the expansion of the universe in all different directions as precisely as we can. Is that so, sort of? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> now remember there's no silly question. Silly question is one you don't want to ask, but ask it anyway. So and I, I should have said at the beginning, stop me, stop me by stop me and ask a question. I didn't do that. But the time is now. So you can be tested on the way out. <laughs> you have a question. So when we were talking, you say you don't believe in infinity. What do you mean by that? When this, this well, okay. Thing? So it's not really a scientific statement, but people think infinity is just a very, very big number. You know, there are millions, billions, trillions, trillions of trillions. And even, you know, a trillion, trillion, trillion is nothing compared with infinity, which is a totally different thing. A mathematical. Infinity is going to place in mathematics. The question is, is the universe infinite? I mean, and um, we just don't know the answer to it, really. If it's going to continue to expand forever and ever, which is infinite time, then it's going to have infinite space. But um, my gut feeling is that uh, it's not going to happen like that. It's going to come down to recollapse. The whole history of the universe is going to be finite in time. So, does that mean there's a beginning of time and an end of time if it collapses down to a big crunch in the future? Maybe, but I have another idea that actually it will come down to a big crunch, and the big crunch and the big bang are actually joined together because time is a closed circle, a closed loop. Now, I'm not saying this is an established theory, it's not, it's my crazy theory, but, but I, that way time could be finite but without any boundaries. And you can say, how's that possible? Think of the surface of the Earth. The surface of the Earth, a sphere, a sphere. The surface is finite. It's got no boundaries, no edge to it. You go off in any direction on the surface of the Earth, you come out where you started, you've gone out of the loop. And it's possible that that's also true in three-dimensional space. So if you sent up a laser beam, 
or he went off in the speed of light in one direction to never get to the edge of the universe but he'd come back around in the other direction. Now that's not going to happen because the universe is bad, <laughs> if it starts contracting, these things blow your mind a bit, right? But it's possible mathematically to have a universe that is finite, no edges, no boundaries, but um, with, you know, like, and, and that's, Einstein thought that could be true in space, that it's finite with no boundaries, but um, I'm saying, well, maybe that's true in time as well. Time goes forward, but end in a big crunch, but big crunch is actually loop around, it's the same as a big bang. So there's this one singular event that, if you believe in singularities, you might say that an infinite density of big bang, but in my idea, it's not infinite, it's just really, really big. Really, really big and infinity, different thing, not that. Friction, Buzz Lightyear, to infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> and beyond, yeah, yeah. So, but here's another so fascinating thing. So, I did mention that the, pro the, the proton is a bit lighter than neutron. Why? Because the down quark is a bit heavier than the up quark. Now, had it, and that means that three neutrons, which were there in after the Big Bang in space, these neutrons, but they decayed, their lifetime about 50 minutes. They decayed to proton, electron, and neutrino. But the proton is stable. That meant hydrogen could form. And so we could, our life is basically based on hydrogen and carbon, so, which are sort of miracles in a way, because the universe could have been different. And if the neutron had been lighter than the proton, the proton would have to no neutrons, and there would be no hydrogen, because the proton would all disappear. And our universe would be quite different without hydrogen. And then life, as we know it, is all based on carbon. 